Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Fred McCullough. My wife, Allison, and I have been members of the church for 15 years or something like that. Um, we've served in various uh, areas. Man, it's bright up here. Uh, we've served in various areas throughout the uh, time that we've been here. Um, some of y'all might recognize me better if I put one of those really bright vests on because I like help with parking lot greeting during Easter or Christmas Eve services. So uh, most recently, I'm helping with the children's uh, section or children's Christ kids time at 11 o'clock helping with their Sunday school so um, so today we're reading out of uh, Ephesians 6 verses 10 through 18 and the scripture we're reading out of the English standard version finally be strong in the Lord and and in the strength of his might put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil For we do not wrestle against the flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take of the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flames, flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times in the spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Fred. All right, I want to invite you to take out your sermon notes. Um, The sermon notes provide an outline of the message today. And and, uh, I just want to encourage you to to use those sermon notes as we make our way through this. Um, I I believe that that, uh, these are not just beneficial for um, sort of taking... um, notes of the, of the message and filling in the blanks to, to hang with me while we go through this. But I think it's also an opportunity for you, uh, as you as you ref- look back at this notes page, um, as the week goes by, I believe God continues to speak to you um, about what it is that we're talking about today. And I believe this subject that we're going to deal with is one that, that is relevant to every single one of us. Um, this is a word that's uh, that the Lord has impressed um, heavily on me, and, uh, and I hope that, um, that he does the same with you this morning. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, in these moments ahead, I pray that you would speak a word that every single one of us needs to hear. Whether it comes from my lips or in spite of them, Lord, I pray that that we would hear clearly what it is that you have to say. Lord, I don't believe it's accidental that we're here right now. For you set this appointment with us a long time ago. And so here we are, God. I pray that you would keep our hearts and minds open to you. I pray, God, that if there... Uh, are any things that we might have brought with us when we came into this space that would make it difficult for us to hear clearly what it is that you want to speak over us and into our lives, then God, through your spirit, would you um, cause those things to be set aside so that we can hear clearly your word. And I pray, God, that you would deliver me from me and hide me behind a cross so that the words I speak will not be mine but yours. For I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I want to start by asking you a question. It's really, really a simple question. Um, it's a question, in fact, I've been thinking about since, uh, since last Sunday. And, and the question is this. What's the truth about you? If you really think about that question for a minute. What's the truth about you? What, what do you believe about you? What do other people believe about you? What do your family members believe about you? What what does your spouse believe about you? What does your roommate believe about you? 
What do those people that you're closest to in your life believe about you? What is the truth about you? You know, sadly, way too many people discern about the, that they discern the truth about themselves based on the answers they glean from the sources I just named. And, and, and that's what they live with every single day. A relative truth that's, that's shaped for them by the opinions of other people. Do you understand what I'm talking about? You know, it's amazing to me how much power we, we hand off to other people to mold and, and shape what we think about ourselves. And then last week, I, I talked about, about the truth that, that, that God wants to speak over our lives. Not the truth that other people try to make us think about ourselves or what the enemy tries to make us think about ourselves. But, but what about the truth that God wants to speak over you and into your lives, that he wants you to believe about yourself. I mean, I, I talked about how, how God declares that we are his treasure. I talked about how, how be, because of what Jesus has done in your life, you've been redeemed. And because of the fact that the Holy Spirit has taken up residence in your life, I talked about how, how you are unbeatable by the enemy. I also talked about how because of what, what Jesus has done for you on the cross and through the finished work of the cross, you can stand triumphant in any battle that, that you face. And then I talked about how because of, God's, because of the work that God has done for you and in you, once you've claimed him, his son as Lord and Savior over your life, you are from that point forward God's son and God's daughter. And because of that, you are an heir to the kingdom. And that's the truth that God wants to speak over all believers. But if you're here today and you have not accepted Jesus, his son, as Lord and Savior over your life, then I want you to know this. The truth that God wants to speak over you and into you is that he loves you. You may not feel that. You may not know that for yourself. You may not believe that. But he loves you. I mean, he, he made you in his image and he wants you to know that. He wants you to come to a place where you recognize that, that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. And he loved you so much that he sent his one and only son to die on a cross. So that once and for all, your sin could be forgiven and taken care of and removed from you as far as the east is from the west. And once you accept that and, and, and declare his son as Lord and Savior over your life, you then become his treasure. Redeemed by the blood of his son. Unbeatable because of the power of the Spirit. Able to stand triumphantly in the, in the face of every spiritual battle you face. And an heir. An heir to his kingdom. That's God's truth about you. But I want to ask you something. Do, do, you, ever, do you ever feel like you're, you, you're constantly involved in, in, in a kind of tug of war between the truth that you believe about yourself. And on the other side, the truth that God declares about you. You ever find yourself being pulled in, in each of those directions, trying to, to figure it all out in your head? I mean, I know I do. I mean, whether it's a, a chorus of praise or, or a catalog of criticism, when it comes from somebody that, that I know or somebody who knows me, it sticks a lot longer than other things. And it, in fact, it just sort of hangs around in my head, and most of the time it stays long enough to either fester into self-loathing or or it, it blows up like fireworks of self-love. Because you see, I have, this, I have this old self. It's an old self that used to thrive on the praise of other people. I have an old self within me that, 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 that feasted on what other people thought about me. And it, it was an old self that was more about performance than surrender and and I'm just going to tell you, Satan loves to remind me about that old self. Because you see, there's a new self that God has been building since the day I accepted what Jesus did for me on the cross. And, and that new self has been forgiven and redeemed and set free from the shackles that bound that old self. And while I'd like to think that that old self is dead and gone, it's still there. How is, it, how is it with you? I mean, what are the hallmarks of, 
of your old self? Is it gossip? Or deceitfulness? Or a hot temper? Or unforgiveness? Or laziness? Or lust? Or selfishness? Or greed? Or bitterness? Or jealousy? Or, or arrogance? What, what were some of the things that defined or that define your old self? I'm, I'm going to tell you, it's important for for you to know that no matter how, how far you've progressed in your relationship with Jesus and no matter how deeply you've grown into this new self that God is, is trying to fashion in your life, the remnants of that old self are still there. It's, what, it's why one person said, we Christians are a people who are at war with ourselves. And in the old self that continues to crave the pleasures of sin, Satan and his demons have an ally, an intimate ally and an inside man who ignorant of the implications of what he's doing is always eager to open the doors through which the demons may gain access to us and those who fail to listen to this those who fail to master the old self they're vulnerable to future temptations to even more serious sins and so I ask you what's the truth about you is your is your truth Defined by the, the cravings and the desires of your old self? Or is the truth about you defined by God? You see, what we believe about the, the truth about us is, in many ways, sets the direction that we're going to go in, in, in every circumstance and situation we, fight, we face, in every, every spiritual battle we undertake. I mean, what we believe about the truth about us is going to shape the direction that we go. It's why the Bible tells us in Ephesians 6 that, that God has given us spiritual armor to wear. We talked last week about the, the belt of truth, which, is, which, is, which represents the, the indisputable truth of God that defines our existence and grounds us in everything we say and in everything we think and in everything we do. And then there's the breastplate of righteousness that we're talking about today. Righteousness. It's not a word we... We use much in, in our conversations today, unless it's used with a negative connotation when we say things like, well, you know, that person's self-righteous. That person's holier than thou. And, and, but, and so I got to thinking, because we don't use that word very often, I got to thinking, if we're going to put on this piece of armor that's, that's, that's named the breastplate of righteousness, then I think, I think we ought to have a pretty good idea about what it represents, don't you think? So Righteousness. In the Old Testament world, and I, and I guess you could really say that this also applies to the secular world that we live in today, a, a person was considered righteous if they followed all the laws. That's what gave a person the, the definition of a, of a righteous person, if they followed all the laws. In fact, Deuteronomy 6.25 says that we will be counted as righteous when we obey all the commands that the Lord our God has given us. And I'm going to tell you that was easy to do when there were only ten. But by the time Jesus was born, there were 613 laws that people had to follow. 613. Which means that there was absolutely no way possible that a person could be declared righteous. Because there was no way that one person could ever follow all 613 of those laws. And so God entered in. And God made a way for a, a sinner to be declared righteous. He sent his one and only son to die on a cross. He made that one who was without sin take on all of our sins so that when we declare him as Lord and Savior over our lives, the, the completed work that he performed on the cross for us then becomes transferred to us. The, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21 that he says it this way, that God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. All right, so I know it's, it's, it's uh, afternoon right now, so just geek out with me for just a second. Um, I, I want to go, go deep here for just, for just a second. This is actually called the imputed righteousness of God. And I'm just going to tell you until today I'd never used that word imputed in church, ever. 
but, but I want you to understand this word, the imputed righteousness of God. In fact, will you just say that for me? The imputed righteousness of God. Say it again because I want it in your head. The imputed righteousness of God. The imputed righteousness of God affects our position with God. God imputed righteousness into us. And because of that, it affected our position with God. And, and this, this means that, that because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross, and in response to our declaration as, as, of, of Jesus as Lord and Savior over our lives, we can one day stand in the presence of God without spot or blemish. That's what this means. And it's important to understand that this imputed righteousness of God is, is not something that we, that we create. It's not something that we work to, to, to make happen in our lives. This is a gift of God. So at one level, this, this breastplate of righteousness that we put on represents our standing uh, as Christians before God. Because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, we are able to stand blameless in the presence of God. And, and, and what this says to me is that there is nothing I can do to change the way God thinks about me. It is to say that when, when God looks at me and he looks upon me as a sinner, God doesn't see my sin. He sees his son. You see, it's by his wounds, it's by his stripes that we're healed, the prophet Isaiah says. Tony Evans put it like this. He said, imputed righteousness can be compared to God crediting your account or putting money in your bank. The money now belongs to you. No one can take that money away from you. Even Satan cannot take that money away. Once you are saved, Satan can do nothing to change your righteous standing before God. Okay, we're done geeking out here. But that's the imputed righteousness of God. That's what it's all about. There's, there's another form of righteousness, though, that this breastplate represents. And that's the, the practical application of the truth of God about you that you live out in your daily life. And I'm just going to tell you, this is where Satan wages war against us. Because it's in this arena where we make choices that affect the things that we say and affect the things that we think and affect the things that we do. And so I don't think it should come as any surprise to you that, that this, is the, this is the place where Satan likes to wage war against us. Because while he cannot take away our imputed righteousness... He cannot take away our standing before God. That work was accomplished on the cross once and for all. So while he can't take that away, he can press into our old sin nature and cause us to doubt all that God has done for us. And in doing so, he can affect the way we live. He can affect the way we represent Jesus. He can, he can affect the way... And here's the way, here's the, that, that word righteousness again. Satan can affect our practice of righteousness in this world. And this is where the breastplate of righteousness comes in. Because, because I want you to think about what this breastplate covers. We talked about it over the cross with the kids a minute ago. It covers your heart. And while the heart in a, in a physical sense is the organ that, 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 that causes the blood to circulate throughout the body, the heart in a spiritual sense controls the flow of information and thoughts and feelings that, that spread throughout your whole being. So just like a soldier who's not wearing a breastplate is vulnerable in, in battle to a, a knife or a sword or an arrow penetrating his heart, a Christian who's not wearing the breastplate of righteousness is vulnerable to the flaming darts and arrows that the enemy shoots at us all the time. And this is how it works in our lives. God says that because you've declared Jesus as Lord and Savior over your life, God declares that you are his child. You're his son. You're his daughter. And because of that, you have right standing with him because of Jesus. This is your imputed righteousness. But then Satan comes along. And he causes you to question the saving work of Jesus in your life by, by whispering in your ears things like, oh, you really screwed up this time. You know, because of what you just said, because of what you just said, you've totally blown it with God. There is no way God is going to accept you back after you did that. Or he says something like, you see that old self? You thought it was dead? <laughs> it's not. 
It's always going to come back. You're never going to, you're never going to get rid of that thing in your life. So why don't you just give up and stop fighting? That's the kind of stuff he says to you. But because you have on the breastplate of righteousness, you're able to say, that's a lie, Satan. I am complete in Jesus. He took away my sin and he doesn't get to, he doesn't see it anymore because of what he did. So get behind me, Satan. Or about that old self that, that he talked about. You're able to say, because of the fact that you're wearing the breastplate of righteousness, you can say to him, you know what, Satan, I was that way. I did do those things. It's true. I, that, that used to be truth about me, but it's not true anymore. Because 1 John 1, 9 says, if I confess my sins, God is faithful and just to forgive my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Did you hear that, you snake? You can say to him, I said all unrighteousness. So get away from me now. And then there's that stuff we come up against every day. You know, with other people or with our feelings or with the countless decisions that we have to make regarding our struggles or our temptations. And, I mean, this is where, this is where the practical righteousness comes, comes into play in our lives. See, God has given you this breastplate of righteousness so that you can stand firm when these kinds of attacks come your way. Like, let's just say you're engaged in a conflict with another person. She said something that really hurt you. But it wasn't just something that hurt your feelings. What she said literally cut your feet out from under you and knocked you down. It really hurt. Well, without the breastplate of righteousness, those kinds of attacks are going to hit you so hard that it's likely you're going to return fire on that person and just let them have it. I mean, I mean, you're likely to not even think about how you're going to respond to that person. It's going to be kind of like ready, fire, aim. I mean, you're just going to go after them and not even care what it is you say. And in the end, you're going to probably wish that there were some things you said or did that you didn't do. But if you're wearing the breastplate of righteousness, then when that conflict comes your way, you're going to remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18. When he said, if another believer sins against you, go privately and, and point out that offense to the other person. And if that other person listens and confesses, then you've won that person back. But if you're unsuccessful, then take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything that you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. And so instead of avoiding the conflict, or even worse, letting it fester into all kinds of unhealthy reactions, then because you're wearing the breastplate of righteousness, you're compelled and you feel like you have the authority and the courage to step into it with a spirit of reconciliation and love, knowing that Jesus is right there with you. Or suppose there's that thing that, that comes up against you on a regular basis. Maybe it's a situation at work. Maybe it's a struggle you're having in your marriage. Maybe it's, maybe it's a fear that you face a lot. Without the breastplate of righteousness that's covering your heart, those things will take you down every single time. You'll think things like, well, there it is again. Am I ever going to be free from this? Am I going to have to deal with this the rest of my life? Is anything ever going to change? And... And you get to the point where you just always seem to walk around angry and bent out of shape because of how powerless you feel against those things. And it affects all of your interactions with other people. But with the breastplate of righteousness covering your heart, you're able to call to mind what the Bible says in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, where we're encouraged to not worry about anything, but instead pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all that He's done. Then you'll experience God's peace, which exceeds anything that we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So when those things come up, and they will, because you're, but because you're wearing the breastplate of righteousness, Satan doesn't have an open doorway into your heart to take you down emotionally. But instead, you can stand firm against whatever things might try to prevent you from representing Jesus in all that you say and in all that you do and in all that you think and in all that you feel. Or suppose you're at the office. 
Things haven't been going well at home lately. You're not fighting all the time, but, but it's just that there's not been much of a spark, you know. You've been working hard. Not much downtime. Certainly no time for deep conversations. And you help the kids finish their homework and, and you make sure all the, the details are covered and you, you finish what was left undone during the course of the day. And then you go to bed only to wake up and follow the same routine the next day and on and on and on it goes. And then one day there's that coworker who comes up to you and says something that ignites a spark inside of you, something that, that you didn't imagine would happen. And I mean, he doesn't come on to you, but it's just that he notices you. And you haven't felt noticed like that in a long time. And if you're not wearing that breastplate of righteousness, then I'm going to tell you, the enemy's really going to turn up the heat on that kind of interaction. He's going to start saying things into your, into your ears like, go talk to him again. That's it's nothing, just a conversation. Nobody's going to be hurt. Just, just go talk to him again. It'll, it'll feel good. And, and so you go have that conversation. And you have another one. And another one. But if you are wearing that breastplate of righteousness, you're going to hear the pleading of the Spirit to guard your heart. To recognize that, that nothing could, could possibly come out of that that's good. And you're going to hear the Spirit warning you that that, that second look, that second look is always going to, to, to invite the enemy into your private world and cause all kinds of, of confusion and, and turmoil. And, and he's, he's going to get into your heart and affect your brain and affect your relationships in your life. And so that breastplate of righteousness that you're wearing in that moment is going to cause you to speak these words, get behind me, Satan. And you flee from it as fast as you can. Or suppose that you're dealing with, what, suppose what you're dealing with has nothing to do with another person. But it's just on you. You look at things that you know you shouldn't look at on the internet. Or, uh, You've made some choices in your professional life that are shady at best. Or you made a mistake and rather than own it, you lied about it because you didn't want people to think badly about you. And now you find yourself spending all your time trying to manage the lie. Well, I'm going to tell you, without the breastplate of righteousness on your body, there is nothing to stop you from going deeper and darker into the internet. And Satan knows exactly what pathways to lead you on to satisfy your hunger. And as far as the choices that you make at work, I mean, he will help you justify every choice you make to fit whatever narrative feels best for you. And then about that lie that covered up the mistake, yeah, it's just one little lie. I mean, who's it going to hurt? And if it comes up again, you know what to do. But with the breastplate of righteousness on, you remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18 when he said, if your eye causes you to sin, then tear it out and throw it away. For it's better you, for you to go through life with one eye than with two eyes and be thrown into the hell of fire. And you'll also remember that what the Bible says in Galatians 6 verses 7 through 9, which says, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You're going to always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature, they're going to harvest d decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what's good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Do you get the picture here? Wearing this breastplate of righteousness really matters. Because, I mean, if, if we don't put on that breastplate of righteousness and let it do its work in the battles that we, that we fight, Satan will advance every single time. And it won't be just that he, that he gains ground in, in, in your life. He will also gain ground in the lives of, of those others who are harmed by our insufficient witness. So here's what I want you to leave with today. I want you to leave here today believing that the breastplate of righteousness is vital to your Christian witness. And, and it's essential for your protection against the attacks of the enemy. You've got to have it on. I was 
talking to a friend of mine, Randy House, the other day. John, you can tell him that I, that I, I mentioned his name in, in church today, but he told me he was a helicopter pilot in Vietnam, flew Huey helicopters. And he, uh, he said they had, a, they had a piece of armor that they wore. It was called a chicken plate. I think that's what it was called, a chicken plate. It was made of ceramic. And, um, and he said uh, the helicopter pilots um, that, that died, most of the time died on their first mission because they didn't wear their chicken plate. Because they didn't believe it was important. He told me about how many times he came back with a chicken plate that had been shot up. He knew how important it was to wear it. And in the same way, it's vitally important for us to wear this breastplate of righteousness. Because it, it, it will protect us from, from any of the attacks of the enemy. So I want, you to, I want you to leave here believing how important, how vitally important it is for you to wear that breastplate. I also want you to know that you cannot manufacture your righteousness. It's not something that you can just make up. It's why it's important for you to, first of all, recognize what God has done for you. Recognize what God has done for you. He saved you from your sin by sending his one and only son to die on a cross. So that, your, so that your sins would be forgiven. And, and, and once you accept him as Lord and Savior over your life, he wants you to know that one day you will be able to stand before God without spot or blemish. And so I hope you'll, you'll walk away from here recognizing all that God has done for you. And I also hope you'll walk away from here recognizing just how important it is for you to accept what God has done and make a decision to apply it to your life. I mean, it's one thing to recognize what God did for you through Jesus, and it's another thing altogether to accept him as Lord and Savior over your life and repent of that sin and make that decision for him. So if you haven't, then let today be that day. And then third, when you leave from this place today, I, I, I hope you will leave with a conviction to believe the truth that God declares about you. And pursue a life that reflects that truth that God declares about you. Or to put it another way, I hope you'll walk away from here making a, a concerted effort to pursue righteousness as you wear this breastplate of righteousness. As Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6.11, he said, But you, Timothy, are a man of God, so run from all of these evil things. Pursue righteousness and a godly life along with faith and love and perseverance and gentleness. Fight the good fight for the true faith. And hold tightly to the eternal life which God has called you to. So stand firm in that truth that God declares about you. Believe to the depths of your being that, that you are a treasure to God. That you have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. That you are because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. You are unbeatable. And because of the power that Jesus wants to unleash in your life through his Holy Spirit... You are able to stand triumphant in the face of every battle that you, that you fight. And then finally, because God has claimed you as his child, you are an heir to his kingdom. That's the truth that God wants you to believe. And so I hope you'll go and, and actively pursue a life that grows out of that truth and represent Jesus in everything you say and in everything you think and in everything you do so that when the enemy comes, and he will, you will be able to stand firm. That's my prayer for you. Let's pray. God, I thank you. I thank you for the blessing of being able to gather together and talk about this spiritual armor. God, I pray for any who are in this room right now who haven't declared your son as Lord and Savior over their life, I pray, God, I pray that they would come to recognize how absolutely imperative it is for them to do so. So that they can stand on the truth that you have declared over them that they are your treasure. They've been redeemed. That they're unbeatable. And stand triumphant. And they're an heir to your kingdom. And out of that truth, God, we can live a life that represents Jesus in everything we say and in everything that we do. And as each day passes, 
we become more and more like Jesus as we feed on your word and take in the truth that your spirit whispers in our ears. Thank you, God, for that blessing. And thank you for that opportunity. I pray this in Jesus' name.